Welcome to Tribe Stories. My name is Aaron Mashano, entrepreneur and chief of the Tribe Hut. And each month we bring you an inspiring person or a message with a hope to equip, connect and collaborate with you to help you on your journey to doing remarkable things. Thanks for spending some time with me today and thank you so much for finding our tribe. Now let the sharing begin. Welcome guys again to Tribe Stories. I'm Aaron here, the host for Tribe Stories today. And very, very privileged to have the Lisa Dora, if I say that pronounced well with a German accent I've been practicing. She's the founder and CEO of Rose von Scharen. And I'll get it to correct that in case I haven't got it right. But uh, she's been a great, great uh, connection we've had over the almost a year now. That'd be right. Uh, Lisa? Uh, Nearly. Yeah. Almost, yeah, yeah. And uh, she hails from Germany. So I won't steal the thunder, but I'd love to get straight into her maybe introducing herself and maybe give us a little bit of an insight as to why she chose that brand. So uh, Lisa, over to you. Yeah. So it's Lisa Dörrer. We have this uh, called like a t the umlaut with two dots. It's an Ö, <laughs> very hard to pronounce. Yeah. Lisa Dora and the name is Rose von Charon. And that is uh, coming from my father. He wanted to give me that name actually when I was born, was not allowed to. And then I think only like uh, seven years ago or so, I heard about that. I didn't even know that he had this idea. And he just mentioned it on the side. And I thought, well, wow, really cool name. Um, and he got it from the book uh, from John Steinbeck. There was a character in one of his books. And yeah, that's how uh, I got the name. Um, and um, yeah, the business itself, um, um, if you want me to go there already, <laughs> how that started, yeah. It's, yeah that's again, that's my, my mom's fault. So it's kind of my parents, you know, like both of them. <laughs> um, they they kind of made me who I am and, and uh, really because my mother is also a goldsmith and so uh, she had a workbench in our apartment when we were where we grew up and so I was always going to school and 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 thought well it's also so boring what am I doing this for <laughs> kind of and then I saw my mother um, had her own workbench uh, so she could work at home also for the company that she worked for. And so I, I, I kept like, when I was allowed to, I was watching her um, working with the gold. She had this fire on her bench. She had those sparkling stones. And so I was always very excited and happy when I was allowed to watch. Um, and also I already started working uh, as for side jobs, always in jewelry companies. And I guess that also came because I was growing up then in Pforzheim, which is the jewelry city of Germany. And 80% uh, uh -huh. of jewelry in Germany was produced there. I think now it changed, but um, yeah. So for me, it was very normal that everything had to do with jewelry for me. Um, and, um, and I think for me, and I, I, I think you don't know this yet because I think I have not shared that with you yet, but um, at grade 11, in the middle of the school year, I talked with a friend about what I wanted to be. Um, and I said, well, I want to be a goldsmith. And then we talked and then I figured, well, actually, I don't need to finish school for that. <laughs> and actually I left school in the middle of the school year. I had like one week. My parents asked me to take one week to think about it. And wow. then I was like, I want to do this. So I left the school in the middle of the school year um, and went ahead with goldsmithing. And I don't think I did Maybe I did regret some of the study possibilities, but I think overall I don't regret it. I was happy to wow. start. Wow, I had no husband. idea. So you mean you left school and you never went back or you left it for a little bit and went back? What, what actually happened there? Well, maybe I'll go back someday, <laughs> but not until today. So you have <laughs> until today, that's extraordinary. No. Yeah, I thought wow. if I ever feel like I wanna uh, continue that, I can always go back to what I think. No, nope. don't mm. no need it. I want to follow uh, the goldsmithing, the creating, the kind of more like the learning by doing and by being in all of those companies. That's how I approached it. Wow, that, that must have been a very courageous uh, moment for you to do that. So do you remember maybe if you go back to that place, what were the feelings or emotions uh, 
uh, you know, that were going through you then? And, and how was it like actually starting your first day uh, in, the, in the work experience? Uh, if you could share a bit more about that. Sure. Yeah, so it was real relief for me to have that clarity in this one moment. And I was thinking, why didn't I think of that earlier? Because I struggled at school, um, because I wasn't really sure where the school, what it would help me with for my goals. Um, and I was not the best at school um, later on because I was just not sure where, where should that lead me and so on. So after I've made that decision, it was really a big relief, um, very um, liberating. And um, yeah, I, I went to the Golds, uh, Goldsmith School and there I, I've had a lot uh, more passion for school. I knew why I did every sim single subject. And so I had a very different approach and I was <laughs> good again at school, um, mm. um, at, at the jewelry school because I had a goal with it. I knew why I was doing that. Mm. And so for me, I think it was the healthiest thing I could do for myself in that moment. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's a great story there. So what would you say are the maybe top three or so lessons that you've learned from that past decision uh, and how that's molded you to the becoming the leader that you are today? Um, to follow my, my intuition more, my instincts or that feeling, because I had that feeling to make a change and to know I'm, I was in the wrong place with following the school, which was something that I felt was expected from me to do or people expected from me to finish the school and then uh, graduate and go from there. Uh, whereas I myself felt I actually wanted to go a different path. Um, and so uh, one of the things would be for me to um, understand earlier or notice when I have an intuitive feeling of something and make changes earlier, it can be so very liberating. Um, and also that um, if I really, if I'm really passionate about learning something, it's a whole different thing. If uh. um, the school, if because I had no exact goal with the school before, it was so hard to 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 uh, say, okay, I'll get up. I want to learn this because of this or that. I didn't have that really, other than the expectations from people around me. So I think. Because I knew if I if I'm really good at this at this school for the for the jewelry, I can I I will have open doors for what I want to create later on. Um, and a third thing, <laughs> yeah, I guess a little bit like going for the fun more. Like because I I think my yeah. job is fun, <laughs> and it's I, I've I, I've known um, from when I. I don't know, like with growing up with my mother working at home on, on the workbench, I thought it's it's such it's so nice to see that this can also be work. And I always had this idea that work means something like being in an office, working on a computer only. Um, and I think um, that the goldsmithing, um, it is um, it has so many assets, like there's so many things that uh, one needs to take care of to do uh, the handcraft, the creativity. Uh, the working with really precious metals and and, and gemstones and um, uh, and also for that there's a lot of preparation and and thinking ahead of each product that has to be done so it's also not always easy and and can be very challenging as well um, and so for me that had all I wanted or I like um, to do to have something that's that's just fun for me and that I would know I would like to continue that. And yeah, go for the fun. <laughs> Lesson uh -huh. number three. No, I like that, I like that. And uh, I was actually gonna ask you that question. Are there any uh, challenging things that you're maybe still currently facing that you have to continuously work on to overcome? And maybe have you mastered some of these things lately that you'd be proud of yourself for doing? Yeah, I think um, in a way, or sadly, challenging for a lot of the goldsmiths is um, the the I guess the the financial part really um, because the the handcrafted work uh, is something that is becoming less and less um, with technology evolving, and it's not as acknowledged and valued anymore. And I think um, that is a challenge, and to 
having to explain yourself why something takes time and knowledge and preparation and it's not done easily where in a society you can uh, just order something and it'll be there um, that things like this it's handmade it takes time and 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 that is something challenging um to um under for people to understand the value that a piece has how much how many hours one person spends on one piece and why this makes it so valuable and so different to a piece that is maybe um, <clears throat> like a mass produced piece or something like that. Um, like to, I think the, the value is a challenge, I feel. Mm, that's interesting. So speaking of these pieces, what, what are the favorite pieces that light you up or excite you the most? And how would someone maybe who doesn't know, know the difference uh in the pieces so which parts of pieces or what styles or you know particular designs or materials do you actually enjoy working with that light show up um i think uh, one of my fa my favorite material to work on is i think it's silver uh, it's the brightest of all and you can make it look really white bright shining um and it's easy to work with as well um, and what I love making uh, the most um, is uh, creating textures and surfaces that come from nature. Um, I can really sit there and I have like a, a photo of uh, something and uh, that's something, something I've done before. I have a photo of maybe some wood or some um, um, where, where you can really see some wood structures and textures and I love putting that from the photo or the object uh, into the product just by sitting there and carving in, in the silver or in wax that are both ways uh, to make that happen. Um, but mostly um, like sitting there working in silver and, and engraving and getting this shape kind of more like being a sculptor or <laughs> more than a goldsmith. Um, I really like to do that kind of work. And I think because I've worked as a goldsmith in different companies for nearly 20 years now, I, I felt like I've done like very common things a lot. And what I want to do is really make something more unique or something a bit different to just show that other things can be done with jewelry as well. And um, so I really like to work more with the natural sculpturing parts. Um, and in that I could I can sit there for hours and just continue and look at it and, and do that over and over again. Um, wow. yeah, I lose track of time when I do that. Some yeah, good music I on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed that once actually when we we're trying to get in touch with you and you said you were just lost in it, you didn't check your phone. So it shows you're really, really passionate. So just for people who maybe don't know much about the art, and as you said, you know, we've we're so bombarded by the convenience of things. Could you give uh, the audience a, a, a guesstimate of just a, a basic piece, how long maybe on average it would take you uh, from start to finish and maybe some basic processes in case anyone out there is actually curious to learn about the whole craft? Because uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted you on board here is we want to preserve and encourage artisans to follow their passion. So what would be the process as you'd say and just what would maybe say an average piece would take? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I would make an, uh, a custom um, a piece, um, I would first uh, start with calculating. And so I would go through, all, through the whole process already before I make the piece. I would have like the piece in mind or make a drawing so that I, I can see it or also maybe the customer can see it. And I would already uh, estimate how much time I, it might take me to do that, to calculate the weight. Um, and also there are so many things to consider um, it cannot be too heavy because of the, the metal, it gets more expensive if it's, if it's very heavy or if it's an earring or something or a pendant, you don't want things to be too heavy or also a ring cannot sit really nicely. Like there are a lot of things to consider when planning the piece, then it depends on a stone, uh, which one, if there's a stone and where it will sit and then to have a, a, a setting that uh, fits the stone, not all stones and settings match and each stone is carved differently. And then the setting has to be made especially for that stone. Um, and, um, and with that, I would start. Um, and um, depending on what the piece, like how, how much um, 
uh, how, how difficult it is. It can be like maybe half a day to two or three days or sometimes even a week. I had one time when I made a pendant um, for a customer and the whole process was six months um, because um, wow. she had a very clear idea what she wanted. And um, so uh, I made a drawing first I'm, and then um, I showed a few things in silver first just to make sure we understand what we want. And then I started in, in, the, in the gold and she came and we changed it like every few weeks she would come in, we would make changes until it was like, okay, that's exactly how I want it. So it can take really that long. Um, and, um, but it's a nice process and it's, it's great to see that in the end, um, the, the, the jewelry or the piece is exactly as the customer had in mind. Um, so yeah, it can be very different from piece to piece, how long it would take. Wow. So what, what do you think are the like behaviors or characteristics that you've had to work on in your personal life that has uh, helped you become a great uh, artisan or jewelry maker or silversmith that you think other people maybe don't do and it affects their performance in the marketplace at the moment? Um, I think <laughs> I think my biggest challenge with that was actually my patience. Um, and that is something that I've learned to develop for the jewelry because I'm actually a very uh, impatient person and everyone who knows me knows that <laughs> things cannot be fast enough for me. But I think um, that's a nice uh, balance I have with the jewelry making because then I'm, I have to sit down. It will take as long as it takes. Um, and, and impatience doesn't help at all in that process. Um, so that is something, then the imagination of a piece, usually before I start, it's like closing my eyes. I see the piece already in my mind and, and turn it and wonder what it would look like on the, on the finger, how it, how, which way around to wear it and so on. Um, to have that imagination, I think is also important. And also something that I had to learn um, was, um, especially if I make pieces for a customer to, um, um, to, to talk to people and to be very open and, and, and to um, understand um, what, what another person sees in a jewelry. It's sometimes hard to fit this, like I have an idea, the customer has an idea to understand we're talking of the same thing. That uh, is something, uh, especially in direct work with customers that can be challenging. Um, but with drawings and with slow progress, with sending pictures also of the progress that has been very helpful. And so I could make sure I'm on the right way. Um, but it, that is also something that uh, one needs working with customers. Um, so that, yeah, we, we, we are thinking of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And I can imagine sometimes, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the same in, in your space, but if you don't really listen to not just the needs of the customer, but listen beyond those needs to really ascertain what they're trying to say, because you know better in some cases, they know what they want, but they don't really know how it comes together. Uh, do you find that maybe having good social skills uh, uh, play a part in the success of having a happy customer, plus also making sure your business is uh, viable and successful and at least your art is being celebrated? Or do you think it's just a pretty much, you know, do everything the customer says and then uh, don't, don't, don't worry about your bottom line or, or the time it takes, et cetera. What, what's been your experience with that? I had to develop social skills. <laughs> I had to become a social person no, um, and behave. No, it's, uh, I think it's very important to, um, and it's also nice in the end um, to have a conversation with the people and also understand um, um, where they're coming from, why they have this idea and understand the background a little, and then um, to connect uh, also with the customer and see um, um, what also, what, what is behind the jewelry? Why are they making it? Um, sometimes it's, they have uh, lost a person dear to them. And then um, this is, um, they wanted a pendant because of that person that they have lost. Uh, another time, of course, it's like wedding or engagement rings. And that is also always um, a nice, <laughs> a nice journey to a company that like ought to, to, to be a part of um, when that is getting developed and um, where we can support and help. Um, 
And I think so far I've been really lucky. I like nearly all of my customers have been really kind, nice people that made it very easy for me to be uh, also open, nice, social, and um, to understand and, and help and support and kind of, they kind of create what they had in their minds. And that was, was helpful, definitely. Or is mm -hmm. I like that. And uh, you mentioned something earlier that I never thought about was um, how technologies come in and made things quick and easy and not necessarily uh, for, for lack of a word, valuable, but uh, people just want things now and, and, and right here. But uh, what, what do you think are the, in two parts, what do you think are the potential maybe threats to your industry or silversmiths with technological development? And, and maybe also, what do you think are the opportunities that they are for, for people like you in your position? Uh, you know, and what hopes or suggestions would you give for people uh, who are in your situation? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know. I, I'm. I have mixed feelings about this. On one side, um, I really like to approach the wax making by making it by hand and having it in my hands and seeing it come together. And um, and that is a nice thing I like to do. But I can also see that technology and 3D creations of jewelry can really help um, and and make a faster pro progress of the piece and maybe even create pieces that would be very hard to make from hand. And also with the printing, um, there are so many uh, opportunities or so many possibilities of materials, what to print. So I think, um, I think at some point, or actually I did already work a little bit with the 3D printing um, because um, yeah, it just can do, it can do a few things that I could not do as easily from hand. Um, so it can help and brings opportunities. Um, but I, I personally really like doing um, working with my hands and and I don't know, I feel like I need that challenge to create it um, and see that I can do that and um, and make changes. Sometimes I think if I would create it on a computer, I, I would not maybe see everything that I see when I have it in my hands. I can put the ring on my finger while I make it and then decide, okay, do I want to change something? Does it look fun? Like this part is easier, but I think um, it's also convenient to do a few things with uh, new technologies. Um, they are definitely interesting and exciting and I'm always tempted to buy a printer, but I'm like, nope, no, <laughs> later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I hear, I hear what you're saying. And that's a really beautiful way to put it. What I'm hearing you say is that, you know, you can work with the technology but at the same time, you really love working with your hands. And would it be right to assume that you do get a different texture or a different experience as a person and not necessarily better or worse, but just that if you, you get an artisan involved with their hands, it can give some different experiences to the end user as well. Or do you think it, the end user just doesn't care about that or it doesn't make a difference? Well, I, I it, it would be like a handwriting or something. If I make it from hand, it has something of me in there as well, because I can only do certain things uh, my way or the way my hands let me do it. And so in a way I feel it's like a signature or something that is unique to me that one would get through uh, something that I've made with my hands. Whereas with a computer, maybe it's like a copy paste um, structure combination that might have a look that someone could develop but to me, it wouldn't quite be the same. And I hope that is something that people value that um, each of the lines on a ring were made by me with an intention and carved. Um, and I think that's something that people would would like about it. Yeah, yeah no, I definitely am one of those people. And I, I think there was a interesting read and you know, I'm big on this called uh, small giant thinking or tribe, tribe, uh, marketing rather where you know you really go after a particular product because and this is part of why we do tribe stories you get to know the person behind the brand or the product i really also believe there's a strong pull to people to have that level of affinity which will make them pick your product over something else because they have a relationship or a connection with the interest of knowing you know you put in that extra love or attention and, and regardless of it's a little bit more expensive maybe uh, it's still worth the buy. So um, I'm a big believer in that. So just just curious on, on the point of uh, inspiration. So who have been maybe your heroes or people that have inspired you uh, in your industry and in your life that, that maybe you 
uh, identify with that have helped you maybe make your style of art or choose you to keep going in your business? Uh, do any of these type of people come up to mind uh, as inspirational role models? Um, I think it's not necessarily even a goldsmith or um, that I would think of as inspiration. Um, maybe, well, my mother, um, just um, through like uh, her strength and endurance and um, she's kind of a fighter, <laughs> I think. Like she has had very hard times um, and always um, um, made things work out because she just didn't stop doing and um, and um, so, and I, for me, she's a big inspiration. She's just, uh, yeah, very, very strong, uh, strong in her, um, um, in her, in her processes. Like she, um, um, she, she sets a goal and she goes for it. And um, like with that, she's a goldsmith inspiration. But then, style-wise, or from the um, I, ideas. I'm a huge fan of the uh, Singer Björk um, or, um, or artists that are like, I guess considered thinking outside of the box, but I think what they actually are doing, they're just being authentically themselves. And that is something that I find very inspiring because it's something that is not <laughs> that easy for me to be, um, to, or it's, it's something challenging to always express your authentic self um and um i like that it is, seems to be so easy to some um people that just are themselves and express themselves and it can be felt um or um like the um painter uh hilma Ach uh, klimt that i have over here <laughs> actually is also i think it's really cool because she actually uh, got the inspiration through uh, seances like they had held like uh, little seances and then they got the inspiration coming to them and that was like in 1903 or five wow. um, so very early on um, and then um, she had her paintings uh, kept away or stored for 50 years because she said society is not ready for this um, but she knew exactly what she wanted to do and she did it her own way um, and, and that I find very inspiring or also um, the fashion designer Vivian Westwood. Um, I've read her biography and her uh, book uh, Get Alive and, and she's also um, a radical environmentalist. Um, so I like her approach of buy less, choose well um, and, and that as a fashion designer <laughs> to say that I think that's great, and um, and she's working until now. Although she's, um, yeah, older than most people who's who are still working, and um, she's also a big inspiration um, in just going her way and and being such a great leader and idol for other uh, people or women to follow. Yeah, big inspirations to me. Wow, well, I love that, and uh, definitely says that comes through your work with these inspiring women uh, so maybe just uh, changing directions a little bit here because i'm curious but would there be anything that you would say you are afraid of and if so what is it yeah sure i mean i'm afraid that um that that the jewelry i'm making uh, that i'm the only one who likes that <laughs> because it's a bit it's it's unique and um and, um, but um, yeah, with the way I've developed it now, I have uh, people around me who will let me know um, what, um, what, the, what they like. So I do have a feedback on that, but that is still something like what, whatever is in here, is that something that others can relate to? Um, and also um, it's a little bit um, a fear still left of, can I do this? Am I, am I strong enough? Am I, do I have what it takes to do it? And that is something um, that feeling comes up a little bit every day um, where I'm like, oh God, I have this many plans. I need to actually work 24 hours a day to accomplish everything. And like, how am I going to do this? And then I'm like, okay, sit down, you have a plan, look at the plan, what's scheduled for today and just follow those steps and keep going, keep going, make changes if you need changes. And, but still that feeling is there all the time. Um, and um, 
but there's also excitement and and like let's do it let's try it let's go for it and um see what it can do <laughs> yeah no that's a beautiful attitude and i, I read somewhere a psychologist was uh, doing an operation on someone and they were saying there's actually no physiological distinction in the body between uh, fear and excitement. So it's really interesting that you use those two words to convert uh, that feeling there. So I just wanted to acknowledge you for that because I think also a lot of people that I've interviewed, uh, not just on this channel, but in general, when I do coaching sessions, sometimes we're so busy talking in the affirmative that we don't also acknowledge the fear and it's true in some cases that fear could be false evidence appearing real but I like the other uh, analogy some people use is you know face the fear uh, uh, you know and run or face the fear and rise and that could be the other way of looking what the acronym uh, F-E-A-R stands for so I really see you doing that in a lot of the events and the sessions and coaching that we've done in every turn when I see you kind of hitting a challenging opportunity to explore that and then face it with excitement and get on with it. So that's that's really been an inspiring thing to, to, and I don't think I've ever told you that part, but that's something I've really noticed in the journey that we've been working together almost a year. So I, I, there's this element that a lot of entrepreneurs or people I talk to and me included, say sometimes you just gotta go with a gut feel about things uh, to keep going for the future, it's gonna work out. So um, what's been your feeling or sense of gut feeling? And if that's something you identify yourself with, could you maybe in your own words, share you know, examples of what that means to you and whether it's important or not in, in, in your journey so far? Um, yeah, I, I certainly noticed when I do, didn't follow my gut feeling and then later on I have the extra work <laughs> because sometimes when I do something, there's this nagging feeling like you should look at this again, you should um, do this differently and I'm like, ah, I'll leave it, um, it'll be fine and then later on I'm like, oh, why didn't I do this, like this would have saved me so much work. And I know that moment, oh yeah, this one month ago, I considered this, but I was too lazy or something, or I was distracted or whatever, and I didn't do it. And then um, I, 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 I <laughs> um, yeah, I regret that I didn't follow my gut feeling. And um, now what I like to do is if I do, do have a gut feeling about something, um, I actually, I put it away um, for a moment, do something different and see whether it stays and if it makes sense still um, think about, I think about it a little bit also. Um, and, um, and then I decide, okay, I'll do it um, mo most of the time. But um, okay. yeah, I, I've certainly, I certainly did regret um, sometimes, um, or it can be like a feeling like something it's like, oh, this is getting too thin, it will not hold or something um, like that would be like an example and like, oh no, it will be fine. And then it's all done. And then like, when then, and it, when you find out at the end that you had the gut feeling and you didn't follow up on it, and then you may have to make the whole piece again. That's very regrettable. <laughs> I was going to ask you, so could you give an, a real example of where you said you wasted time and you should have followed something that could be quite useful for us maybe? Um, if I it's think, possible. yeah, um, um, I think for me, I would think about it in, in, in work ways or in making a piece when I sometimes think I should sit down and take the time and measure things. Um, and whereas uh, sometimes I just want to go ahead and start doing it with my hands. And then I, I like that is sometimes when I didn't go through all of it before, um, like for example, when I had a stone and I had to make a setting for it, I knew I should measure, I should understand what thickness do I want in the end. And, and then sometimes I just think, okay, I'll just make it. I start with this and form it, um, uh, forge it until it has the shape that I want. And then in the end, maybe some areas are too thin because I didn't measure everything beforehand, didn't make all of the, um, I mean, it takes a lot of time and preparation to make it right. Um, and um, yeah, and, and sometimes I've maybe worked for half a day or a day to find out after this day, I cannot use this setting because it didn't turn out the way I was thinking it would. Um, and, um, and then I have to make it again, really measuring. But it's also always a learning a little bit um, when I've 
made those mistakes um, to see also why it didn't work um, and um, and and I've also learned from that if I make really big pieces or pieces that will take um, many, many days to do. And I don't want to make any mistakes that I would make it in silver first and only later on would make it in gold so that I can try and figure out things or make mistakes in silver and not in gold. Yeah, I like this. I didn't actually know that because uh, you said at the beginning you like working with silver because you can make it shine and it's brighter for her correctly. And then I've heard you when you were talking about this other client that took you longer to 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 work with, but was meaningful. Is you started in silver before you moved to gold. So, what what does that what does that say about silver compared to gold in this case? When you seem to trial something in silver, it sounds like more than gold. I, I'm trying to make the connection there. Yeah, like I like uh, to work with silver because it's um, more flexible, um, easier to solder and work on. So sometimes. Um, easier than some gold alloys, um, but also um, it's just simply the value of the gold, how much gold costs. Okay. So if I make a mistake in gold, there's a bigger loss than when I have uh, worked in silver. And if I, we can remelt the silver and well, both of it, but um, um, the loss of the gold would be higher. Um, so that's why we like to try things in silver. Mm, mm, I like that. So where, where do you think your full potential is? Or what do you think that would look like when you've actually reached your full potential in your brand or in your craft? Uh, what, what do you think full potential looks like for you? I think my full potential or the part that I love the most is really the developing part. The I think the whole understanding probably or getting feedback what is needed and like the idea in between to make a piece work. Um, and I've worked in this position in some companies already where I was in between design and before the production to understand um, what, what techniques do I need to imply? What, um, how do I make a master model um, in a way that it can be uh, reproduced easily or that it can be casted? Um, and to um, try new techniques or new materials, uh, try uh, new structures and this kind of like a um, scientist kind of approach or like just like the trial and error, figuring new things out, trying new techniques. Um, that is a part that I really like doing. So I think um, it will be a whole combination of understanding what is, what is wanted, what is needed and to go through that progress and make it the best way possible so it can have really great results that people love wearing. Yeah. Mm, I like that. Never asked that question before. So what, what do you think you would need to find or utilize that could help you get to that next level in your full potential now? What do you think is missing and, and, and how, how do you think you can bridge that gap to get to that full potential you're talking about? Well, for the moment, I cannot wait to get feedback on what I'm just creating right now. Um, I think it's a very unique style and I'm hoping to find my people that will also really like this kind of style that will love to wear this as, as something very unique to them, something that they will love. And um, for me, I think at the moment, as I'm really just um, trying those things by myself, sending out um, some pictures to, some people so they they can give me some feedback but i think that is my next step to show what i've actually made in the last uh, weeks um to, sh to show it and then to get feedback and i think to go from there to see okay start all over again <laughs> or or those those three okay i'll continue the other one now nah. <laughs> do something different or um yeah that's the next thing i need and i'm already excited to see mm -hmm. To see what people think of it yeah i know the launch is coming up soon we're going to talk about that shortly but what what um just based on that potential again uh, you know what do you wish you could have done sooner that you know now that actually contributes hugely to your success today um i think i could have started uh, my whole business earlier in my life actually i i had i had it in me um and um i was always going an easier way for a while um, um, and I've 
done this, the things that I'm doing for myself or for my business right now, I've done that for other businesses for a long time because it was more convenient. Um, and I see that, that I could have done that earlier. And also um, I really like the approach um, that I'm doing now with the testing. I didn't really consider that um, before our course. <laughs> um, I've done the EIP course with you and that was one of the uh, coursework um, to consider already from the start to uh, exchange ideas um, and to see, to get feedback, to hear people, what do they actually like about jewelry? Why do, it, why do people like to wear it and when and what kind? So I've actually done a lot of research and I'm kind of more developing my products now with, with others, with other people's feedbacks. Whereas before I would have just finished everything and then um, just showed a finished piece and then it could be all or nothing. Whereas now I can, can, can get a feeling, okay, this is probably these kind of people will like that then and, and others might, might like a bigger piece because I know they go for that for certain occasions. And, um, and it's not as much as a challenge. And that is something, if I would have known that earlier, I think it's an, a way easier thing to do rather than to go like, I'm not gonna share my idea with anyone and nobody should hear about it until it's finished. And then it's like all or nothing. Um, um, that's, that's, that would have been my approach before. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that anymore, yeah. Now that's really powerful, and thanks for uh, sharing that about the the EIP program. Uh, just testing is important, uh, and maybe on a, on a on a tangent connected to all the hard work I know you're putting in. Do you see, at least in your journey, that uh, there are maybe some challenges to, say, for example, your time when it comes to doing your business? Uh, let me rephrase: how, how does your intimate or private life? get affected by your passion for your business? And if so, how do you work the two to make sure you have uh, healthy relationships inside work and outside work? Um, it has a huge impact actually. And I really need to schedule people into my uh, weekly planner because um, if I don't do that, I, I kind of forget about it and I just continue to work because there's always things on my to-do list. Um, but I also feel that I really start uh, losing motivation and enthusiasm if I don't meet other people and talk about it or just do something very different for some time. Um, so I've really now integrated in every week um, to, to just meet with other people um, outside with Corona and, <laughs> and to um, just um, have, have some free time and not talk too much of the jewelry. Um, and also exchanging ideas. I think that is something that I like about um, being with others the most um, to, to get this vibe, this, um, hey, I'm working on this. What do you think? Hey, great idea. Why don't you do this or that? And that's a connection that I have a lot uh, online, but it's, it's such a different approach or a different feeling when I meet with people and we're just like ping pong, like, Hey, this idea would be working really cool. Have you ever tried that or this material and, and just creating things like that. And it's such a different motivation. And yeah, I'm talking about work again. You asked me about your five <laughs> Yes, I did. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Intimate and private yeah. relationships. Yeah, and the connection. <laughs> Yeah, that or, is or what strategies? Yeah, what strategies? Yeah. So you said one was uh, scheduling your week to make sure you don't miss it, so you're in work. Uh, yeah. And what's happened when you haven't done that? Maybe because I think a lot of audience would, who, like you said earlier, you know, the reason I asked is, like all of us, we always say we could have started our business earlier, uh, but then if we did do that, we might have had to also manage our relationships differently mm -hmm. earlier. So I'm trying to. One, see where your journey has been when it comes to managing relationships outside your business focus and how do you then juggle that as a woman, as a business person uh, and making sure, I guess, you keep that sense of uh, harmony uh, between your work and your, your, your business. Uh, so your, mm -hmm. your, your work, your business life and your personal life uh, to, to maintain those relationships. So, yeah, so you mentioned schedule. And I was really interested in that. And then uh, would there be any other strategies or advice you'd give people and maybe other areas you're still struggling with today? Yeah, I think it's so important to stay in touch uh, with people um, and not um, losing track of that. Um, 
And it can be very isolating, especially in the moment where we're not allowed to see as many people to only focus on the work. And so I, I, I'm actually ha having a very active like uh, WhatsApp or other kind of group uh, life where I'm exchanging uh, many ideas and having people from uh, outside of my bubble here because um, I guess also because I've lived in many places around the world, I'm connected to a lot of, uh, to a few countries with people there. And it's very important for me to keep those relationships up and eventually visit now and then. Um, and um, yeah, definitely um, to, to make time in each week um, to, and, and also giving um, relationships um, a higher a high status because we only live once and and I don't want to come into a mindset where work is the only thing um, that's important to me because that's quite lonely I don't want to be a lonely person I like to be with others and um, so yeah mm. I'm making time for it yeah no, that makes sense and I think that's really important to hear because I can definitely for myself go back to a point where I never even brought it up as a question because I mm. never thought about it. And uh, uh, later on in life, I think it, it starts to erode at this uh, experience called uh, significance or meaningful life. Um, so yeah, just, just before we get into a couple of things uh, around you again, uh, just in terms of your current project. So what are you excited about right now that you're working on uh, that, that, that's exciting in terms of projects uh, that are exciting you at the moment? Maybe launches or moment, things that you're doing. Yeah, yeah, what are you working on? Yep. Yeah, at the moment I'm working in waxes, uh -huh. um, and that means uh, carving. I have all kinds of uh, photos um, uh, of of certain shapes in nature in front of me, and then I'm just sitting there thinking of, okay, I really like this curve and this shape. How can I turn or use that for an earring or um, for a ring? And I'm also trying, but not trying, but I. I, I think I, like at the moment I'm working on some leaves and even some leaves um, like decayed leaves <laughs> because I find also some wow. beauty sometimes when a leaf or um, uh, a flower petal when it, it's um, when it's uh, getting dry and it starts to turn and have a lot of movement and um, in it and I find even that or even if it has some pieces where they're missing something. I even find that very interesting. Um, um, and I'm trying to kind of capture that uh, with the jewelry. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just personally very excited about exploring that and to see how that can be turned in metal. And, um, and it doesn't always work at the first try. Like I have something in mind, I start and then like, nope, it doesn't look like the thing I have in my head. So I have to start all over, all over again. Um, but it's all a learning progress. And um, I'm, yeah, this is, this, but it's definitely uh, one of the more exciting parts of my work to explore that. Oh. And uh, you also mentioned to me, you're gonna do a bit of a launch and you're looking forward to feedback. Could you maybe share with us what that uh, launch is about, when it is and how people can maybe find out about that? Yeah. So I'm um, planning to have a pre-launch on the 1st of July and I'm at the moment working on three different themes um, that I have shared with some people already who know what I'm working about. There's a little bit about to like some pictures uh, and uh, to see on my Instagram account. Um, I'm also working um, right now on my uh, marketing or the just so that like the the my my roadmap on what I'm going to share about my pro progress at the moment, so people can see what is it that she's actually doing, um, and why is she doing that. <laughs> so I'm kind of like working that out at the moment, um, and that can be seen and followed on on my Instagram account, mm. um, and that's uh, yeah, Rose von Sharon. <laughs> Great, great. I'll definitely ask you more about the plugs and the socials there in a second. So who, who yeah. would you say is your ideal client and, and what makes them qualify as a great client for you from your experience of the people you've been working with in the past? Yeah, yeah I think it would be a woman who, um, who, has, who wants to show um, her uniqueness um, 
but also um, as a, a picture for the whole, for others, for for us people, and um, for nature um, as well. And um, that um, would like the idea of wearing something that is sustainably made. So there's no regret in that, and support that as well. Something that is made, um, um, yeah, also maybe in a local area or something like here in Hamburg. Um, and um, yeah, just something very unique. Uh, I like that. And who would you say is your non-ideal client for your business? Um, that would be, I think, um, in this case, someone who, who might go for a, a quick trend that may be something uh, or someone who would um, uh, want to wear something that um, could be worn for half a year um, because that's not what I'm making the jewelry for. It's made to be lasting very long um, so that they could have it for all of their life or maybe even pass it on. Um, and um, and some someone who's um, Mena wants to go with every trend, but to more show more of themselves or express themselves rather than, um, oh yeah, okay, now this is a thing at the moment, I want this. Um, it's rather like uh, something, oh, I feel a connection with this piece. Um, I like the shape, I like uh, why it was made, I like the story behind it. And um, so that would be rather a person um, who, who would probably like my jewelry rather than someone who buys jewelry just for, I don't know, like the, the, the glitter or shine, which is also nice, but that's not what mine's mostly doing, yeah. yeah. No, I like that uniqueness. And uh, maybe you touched a little bit about the sustainability. Maybe you could share a bit more uh, about some of the support, the causes and, and how you stay sustainable and what, how would people know uh, that you're ethical or following some of these values? Just share some of the examples of what you're doing differently than other maybe jewelers at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, what I'm, I'm using as metals um, uh, only um, is recycled uh, material. So there's no new um, metal coming in into the process. Um, and um, yeah, for me, that is especially a thing because of the mining that is going on in mostly third world countries. And it can be seen, it can be looked up and what's happening where usually some outside uh, companies or people from other countries are coming in and kind of destroying a whole big piece of land, rainforests um, to get more of the gold. And I think we, we, we do have enough, we can reuse it so that is not necessary. Or even if it's done, it can be done in, in, in better ways. So there are also um, some uh, mining companies um, or some ways to get gold. Like for example, uh, if it's, collected from rivers or something can be also collected in more sustainable ways. So I really want to make sure um, um, to understand where my material is coming from. And right now I'm getting it directly from someone who buys it. So there's uh, no way that it can be coming from another source. Um, and to also see in what other ways and all of the way um, I'm creating the jewelry or sending it or shipping it um how how i can do it in a sustainable way so that i'm not part of the messing up everything <laughs> no really really appreciate that and that's very close to my home I, as you know i grew up in a mining uh state called the copper belt close to the congo border and uh, we extract a lot of uh copper but with the copper as the gold ore and uh, all the other minerals and uh, yeah a lot of those practices to me sometimes were quite wasteful and i was also often wondered if we all got some of the unused or maybe neglected copper and gold and silver in the world. It, it would be interesting to see how much of it could be reused and upcycled. So that's a very, very exciting way to educate us on that. So I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and so how do we actually support you and find you? So what are the best ways people can connect with you? You know, what's your website, social media, Facebook? Uh, I know soon you'll be having an online store. So could you maybe share some handles here? And we'll be able yeah. to share some in the in the in the comments, but uh, just so we can hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a website. Um, it's called rosefunjaron.com, um, and there um, you can find a little bit about me and the progress as well. 
Um, I do follow up mostly on Instagram with pictures to see where I'm at at the moment. And that is also a uh, Rose von Sharon. And um, I have a Facebook account where we'll share a little bit more about the story. We'll go a little bit deeper. Um, but I also can be just simply reached via email, which is at info at rose von Sharon .com. Um, So that is also a very easy way to approach me if others have ideas. Like I'm very open to cooperate with other people, to join any kind of project to work with other designers. I'm, I'm very open for that or getting any kind of input or ideas um, and um, that can all be done through that email address. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for sharing that. So just to find out a few questions here, but one I had curiosity on because I know it's quite challenging for some people to stay true to their passions, as you said, but what do you think is the most important uh, the main reason what stops most people starting their own business? What do you think that is in this day and age? I think it's the mindset. Um, I think it's um, the keeping up the idea that we have for where we're going to be. And if that is not strong enough, it's if that turns out to be not what we wanted in the first place, then I think it's easier to give up on that. Um, and um, so it's very important, I think, to make sure that what someone is doing is really what they're very passionate about. So um, that even on the days, like for me, some days I wake up and then I go, what am I doing? <laughs> but then there's um, so much that I can pull out of like, yes, that's actually, that's a goal. That is something where I want to be. This is why I do it. And if that is not there, then I, I might just not continue or stop when it and when things get hard and they do get hard yeah no that's a really important distinction to acknowledge that they do get hard but it's worth it uh so just final three questions but firstly i, I wanted to acknowledge you lisa uh not just for your courage for your determination for your ballsiness really to stop school at such a young age and trust that at such a place where maybe you had no evidence uh and also i think to like some people don't actually do this, but actually see those role models like your mom and a few inspiring people around you and take that action yourself to say, yeah, I think I'm going to explore this uh, for myself and see that it's going to work out or not. And then just consistently uh, continue with that dream. And I think you're yeah, such a huge inspire, inspiration to, to me uh, and I'm sure the audience, not just because you know, there is an opportunity to do business and everybody's trending in entrepreneurship, but that you've actually kept with the craft and still keeping it as authentic as possible and looking at better ways to make sure the client can still get such a beautiful art, but also looking after the environment. And as you said, not messing up the land and things like that. So I just wanted to acknowledge you for that great courage and consistency that you've, uh, and determination that you've had. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Aaron. <laughs> no, really, man. It's, yeah. uh, it's unbelievable. I never knew some of these stories. That's just a remarkable story. So uh, just, just a couple of final uh, questions there then. Uh, are there any questions that you wish people asked you about you that you'd like them to know? Anything that maybe most people never ask that you would like people to find out about you that maybe people don't know? Any questions there? Cool. Good question. Um... What I would like others to ask me, I think the inspiration, um, like where that is coming from, um, because the, at least for me, other things that I'm doing, um, it is not only about making something that has a certain shape and a stone and that's a pendant and that's it, but more like um, where the ideas are coming from, how everything is developing. Uh, I really like to share about that. Um, and um, what else would there be? Um, yeah, no, I cannot think of anything else. Mm. <laughs> I wanted no, that's to a really good one. I like that the inspiration yeah. of why things are going the way they're going. I like that. Yeah. I think that's a very important question, particularly for artists as well. Uh, okay, so final three questions. So. This one is one of my favorites, but it's, we call it the three truths. So I'd like you to imagine that you've done everything you've wanted. You've produced the greatest classical uh, silver jewelry that shines that people can pass on for many generations. You've done it in a sustainable way. 
and you've really supported uh, local communities and, and made a huge, huge impact. Maybe created books, written things and everything that you've done and you're basically near now the end of your time. And you have to take all the jewelry and all the art, all the uh, casings and, and uh, the samples that you've had, that has to go with you to the next life. But you're left with a pen and a paper and you're asked to share three truths or three lessons uh, to leave behind for people to rem remember you by. So what, what do you think that would be? Uh, I think it would sound very cheesy. But <laughs> I like but cheesy. I think <laughs> I think that really it is um, that um, that we all have what we want. We have it within us to do it and to follow that feeling that keeps coming up um, that wants us to do something else than, than the path we were put on due to other people's perspectives on lives. And we just keep following that because that's the system but to understand um, if I'm honest to myself, this is what I really like to do um, and to follow on that and to explore that, to um, yeah, be brave uh, and, and, and follow that and, um, and make mistakes. That is something actually that I've read. Um, it was a really nice uh, documentary that I saw when they were asking older people for advice for younger people. And one of them was saying, make more mistakes. <laughs> and that's like, okay, I'll do that. I can do that. <laughs> and that is something yeah. that kind of takes the seriousness out of life um, and, and, and gets things to be a whole new approach. And there's always a learning and making mistakes. And um, yeah, I think that's something I I'd, might write on that letter as well. Then the last question here, or last two questions is, who would you say is in your tribe that has supported you the most on your journey uh, to become the person that you are today? And why do they qualify? Um, I think, and it can be only one person. <laughs> uh, no, it could be as a uh, few, maybe 10 or so. Yeah. yeah, well, there are a few people um, who, I have always believed in me uh, with, with whatever crazy ideas I came up with and who always taught me to go for it. Um, and, um, but I think it was uh, mostly very close friends and my uh, sisters actually, who kept pushing me. Um, like my one sister, uh, she insisted that I would start this because she knew I kept talking about this for a while. Um, and both of them are a really huge support. And one of them is following up every week. She's like there to like, so did you do what you said you would do uh, this week? How, how are things going? Um, and that is so great to have, to have someone that I, um, who is very interested, who believes that I can do the things, who's not really questioning it. And also kicking my ass when I'm like, oh, I didn't do this, and um, but I told her I would do that. And so that's, for me, it's a huge support. Mm, I like the accountability partnership and with siblings is very powerful. Yeah. Uh, the rivalry goes from many, many years back, yeah? Uh, yeah, and I'm the oldest. So oh, the pressure. <laughs> I need to show them why I'm the oldest. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I like that. Stamp of approval. Yeah. No, yeah. that's beautiful. Okay, so last question for you. Uh, what's your definition of living a meaningful life a meaningful life well meaningful for me would be um to do something where i could have a positive impact um on others through what i'm doing through maybe through how i'm inspiring others to do things um to have the courage maybe um or also to um try and make things in a way that they have um, no, that they cause no harm. Um, and also in the way that I'm going to set up my business in a way that we have a very nice social um, team um, that doesn't as much feel as work, um, but more like a, better like a little family or something. Um, and, and to have people enjoy um, their work just um, because it's such a big part of life and to have that um, in the business setup. Um, and yeah, 
I think and with the jewelry and the projects that I'm hoping to be in um, in some time, that with that I could also um, teach um, others maybe how to make jewelry, how they could maybe make a living with making jewelry and help setting that up um, and just sharing what I've learned over the last 20 years why I keep it to myself. Like that would be uh, definitely, that would mean something to me. <laughs> Wow, I like that last part of legacy. Thank you so much for sharing. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, spend with us and share a little bit more about you. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure so many of us are gonna learn more and definitely we'll put your links in the comments below and definitely people should be there cheering you on for your next launch. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much for asking me all of those questions. Some of them were but were very new to me so it was very interesting to explore yeah. i didn't know what i would say until <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. how we like it thank so, you so much thanks so much for your curiosity and your support and um i'm really really appreciating this thank you yeah thank you thanks so much <laughs>